when I was uh, called to this position at Fuller to lead the Ogilvy Institute of Preaching, uh, it was an open uh, canvas. There was nothing there that was, was the Ogilvy Institute. Uh, and it was really up to me to work with some other people to figure out what should the vision of the Institute be. This led to spending the better part of a year trying to just understand what is happening in the education and formation of preachers and preaching. And that, in part, took me to many different seminaries. It took me to lots and lots and lots of websites. It took me to churches. And out of all that came uh, some distilled uh, kind of categories of how most preaching, it seems, was being approached. A great deal of preaching formation seemed to happen around preaching as information. Secondly, there were a, a lot of schools and programs of preaching that had a vision of worship that was seeing worship and, and preaching specifically as a form of inspiration. So it was information, inspiration, and the third category that was prominent, but not as frequently spoken about, but palpably present, was preaching as entertainment. Now, those three forms, inf information, inspiration, and entertainment, I would argue are all part of preaching. I can't imagine that we could come up with a robust description of preaching that wouldn't in some way describe and have a valued place even for all three of those. There are high visions for those three things, and there are lower visions of those three things. There are things about those th three categories that might fit quite comfortably in our understanding and theology and practice of preaching, but there would be other ways in which those things are practiced which might be really quite foreign to what it is that we're about. But what concerned me most was that while I could see that, that those categories had their own place, that did not begin to name to me the, what I saw as the crisis of preaching. Now, the crisis of preaching is described, of course, by different people in, in different ways. It's described at times as a crisis that comes about because we're, a, a crisis, uh, we're in a crisis of knowledge in general. So the thoughts of somebody making truth claims, knowledge claims about a reality that's invisible and inaccessible is itself a scandalous and problematical thing. That's certainly true. And therefore, the possibility of being a preacher who asserts and, and defends and argues for that kind of uh, total vision of reality framed by the reality of God made known in Christ is a contentious and controversial claim. That's part of why, um, why preaching is a, is a scandal on that front. But there are, are, I think, much more profound reasons. And to me, one of the most profound reasons is the breakdown between speech and act. So it's often, of course, pointed out that uh, the church is very good about talking, but not very good about doing. And uh, this is captured in part with an image that I referred to this morning, uh, if you happen to be here. It's a story that is told by Max Dupree about <clears throat> the time when one of his grandchildren was born extremely premature, just weighing a little more than one pound. The father of this baby had abandoned uh, Max's daughter, and he rushed to the hospital to try to be a helping grandfather in whatever way he could. The nurse that was attending the baby and his daughter said that what he needed to do was to come every day and to stroke the baby's body and to tell her, her name was Zoe, to tell Zoe over and over again how much he loves her because what she needs most is to be able to connect his voice to his touch. Now, he uses that as an illustration of the connectedness that's needed in leadership. I'm using it today to say that's the connectedness that's needed in preaching. And it's the connectedness that's needed in Christian discipleship. It's this connectedness between what the church says and what the church actually lives. And when there is a break between voice and touch, or when there is a collision between voice and touch, then there's this tremendous sense of a, of a crisis that is created in our capacity to communicate about the thing that we say actually heals voice and touch. So we would say in the proclamation of the gospel that our life is saved by Jesus Christ and it is in the process of being transformed and it shows up until it doesn't show up. It just gets proclaimed, but it doesn't actually show up in the world in many ways. And that dissonance creates a crisis of communication, but it also creates a crisis of identity. What is it that we actually think we're doing and how are we trying to do it in relationship to the people uh, that are around us? Now, that kind of tension is, was captured for me at uh, one stage when I uh, met this young man. I'd seen him in our church in Berkeley uh, for a few weeks, but I hadn't yet met him until one morning early. I was out for a walk near the church, and I saw him coming toward me, and we stood and had a, a great conversation. He had caught my attention because he had two really dramatic orange and red tattoos that came up along his neck and up to his cheekbone that were of flames. And it was pretty 
easily picked out, even in a, a congregational setting. And um, so we began to talk. He was explaining his background. He said he'd been a traveling musician for many years. He said that after having done that for a number of years, he'd come back to graduate school at Cal. He said that he had really given up religious questions, but getting back in school uh, had caused him to want to reconsider some of those questions. Certainly spiritual questions were ones that he had shelved for a long time. He said, I'm, I'm starting to do a lot of reading that I haven't done for many years, and I'm also beginning to visit churches. I go to some churches, he said, and I hear a lot about Jesus, but I hear very little about the world. I go to other churches, I hear a lot about the world, but I hear very little about Jesus. I go to your church, and I hear a lot about Jesus and a lot about the world, but what I want to know is this. If I decide that I'm just going to hang out at your church, if I'm there regularly, will I actually meet people that are like Jesus? Now, the moment that he asked this, not least because this was actually happening on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley, California, I was looking for any sign of sarcasm in his question, any sign of a cynic. There was none of that. There was just this open, vulnerable longing, hope that somehow, if he hung out, would he meet people that actually embody this thing that we're talking about? Would following Jesus show in a way that he could see and hear. Now, that question, quite a beginning to a day, is a question that I want to suggest is really getting at the heart of what the Bible is talking about, about wisdom. If we understand biblical wisdom truly, I think what we get to is an understanding that wisdom is something which is meant to be both seen and heard. It's embodied. So the definition that I have come to use about preaching, about wisdom rather, is that wisdom is the truth and character of God lived in context. The truth and character of God lived in context. And Jesus is himself the incarnation of that kind of vision of wisdom. He is the ultimate expression of the truth and character of God lived in context. But in turn, we, the church, are meant to be people who are the embodiment of the truth and character of God lived in context. And while we don't embody it or live it perfectly, nor do I frankly think that the culture around us even expects it to be perfect. It expects it to be credible. That's a very different standard. There might be some people who will just endlessly nitpick at the church about whether or not it perfectly keeps its witness. I don't think that's the expectation that most people have. They just want it to be fundamentally credible. A feeling that most of the time, much of the time, and especially in the places that matter most, the church actually shows up with authentic life that validates the proclamation that it offers. So in the formation of the Ogilvy Institute, then the question that began to emerge was, if we're going to emerge was, if we're going to shape preaching, then it's not just about the concern for information or the concern for inspiration or the concern for entertainment, but fundamentally the concern for the shaping of pastors around themes of wisdom. What is it that forms an empowered, wise preacher? Because what is needed is empowered, wise preachers who shape empowered, wise congregations who live empowered, wise lives in the world. That's our mission. And it's that trajectory that's not the demonstration or the proclamation of just information. It's not just a few inspiring moments. It's not just some great stories. It's not just some hallowed and extremely important truth claims. It's actually about all of that and much more embodied in a life of integrity, wholeness, wisdom that is about the truth and character of God actually lived in context. And a lot of the concentration that goes into preaching and talk about preaching is talk. It's how do we improve the talk of the preacher? But I think what most profoundly shapes the talk of the preacher is the character of the preacher that actually shapes the talk of the preacher. And so much of what actually gets heard is fundamentally the instinct, the filter, the curiosity, at times the jadedness, the uncertainty of wondering, is that preacher authentic? Are they credible? Do they actually not only proclaim the truth, but do they have some genuine life resonance with the thing that they're saying is the turning point of the whole universe? Surely there's got to be credible witness, credible evidence, credible wisdom that brings these themes together. And yet so often, uh, it's not. So often the scandal of the church 
whether it's related to preachers and their own particular public crises or their private crises or the simple disconnection between themselves as people in a, in a body, in a real world, in a real family, in a real church body, is separated from the spiritual reality that we seek to proclaim. And that crisis is a crisis that I think the Bible is referring to when it talks about the crisis of wisdom. And the, and this, the call, therefore, to live into the truth and character of God that is embodied in real terms in a context is the, the call to wisdom that then means we, the preacher, becomes, by God's grace, an empowered, wisdom-seeking, wisdom-formed person whose life and character are on a trajectory of transformation into the likeness of Jesus Christ that then seeks to call a congregation into that same deep work of transformation where the dissonance between speech and action, between voice and touch, where the hypocrisy that is so often seen within the church and certainly with outside the church is, is actually diminished by being set on a trajectory that fundamentally is committed to holding these two things together. That stream that holds these two things together is what I think Old and New Testament alike mean by the wisdom stream. And the incarnation of wisdom in Jesus is the incarnation of that truth and character of God lived in context. So the kind of uh, third, fourth century debates, not least the Pelagian debates, that often, uh, you know, sent the church running, particularly in some uh, reformed understanding of this later, running from any suggestion that we could be saved by anything other than God's grace, tragically left behind the baby with the bathwater. And the, what got left behind was the suggestion that then somehow if we're going to separate ourselves from a legalism by which there could be any form in which we could make ourselves righteous before God, then it ipso facto leads sometimes to the emotional and even theological conclusion that our action is actually just incidental. I cannot see that in the pages of the gospel. I can't see any evidence that our actions are incidental. They are actually intrinsic to our identity, and they're certainly meant to be intrinsic to our sense of what a mature Christian discipleship is about. So it's this call to hold these two things together and to not be victim to any suggestion that we could ever earn our own righteousness. Absolutely not ever could we do that. And at the same time, our action is not made incidental. Our action, because of the kingdom, is made even more important. It will not be saving action, but it is not incidental to the authentication of God's saving action to which our life is meant to bear tangible witness. Now, because we're a smaller group, I'm just going to pause there and actually have a little conversation with you before moving on, because I want to move on and illustrate this in several different ways, but um, this is a little more of a conversational group. So let me just pause and see if anybody wants to, um, you know, throw a tomato, raise a flag, uh, ask a question, whatever you might like to say. Any response, reaction, questions, anything that you want to say? Well, let me ask sure. You've uh, painted the picture of where we are. Uh, give us just a brief explanation of what brought us here. Uh, what, what brought us to, that, to this point of the, the bifurcation, et cetera? And, and sure, you, you know, you, third and fourth centuries, it was partly there, and yet, yet there's also this contextual moment um, of 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. How do we get to this point? Right. It does obviously have a very long and tortured history, but let me just suggest a couple of things that at least seem to me to be quite significant. I think one of the residues that's a very positive residue of the Protestant Reformation is really this very strong sense that God is the principal actor. And by making God the principal actor in such an emphatic and, and doctrinal way, which, which I think is the right way to explain the character of the grace of God, I think left it open to the possibility then that the shadow effect of that would be that our action becomes much less significant. Now, the ironic thing is that, of course, by the time you get to the Enlightenment, you have the rise of, of the significance of human agency and the significance of, of a human willfulness, which then becomes literally the rival to God as the principal actor. So now it seems as though what gets set in motion is, well, it's either God as the principal actor or human beings that are the principal actor. And faithful disciples will say, gee, given that choice, I'm clearly going to choose God as the principal actor. 
And then I'm going to diminish the suggestion that somehow I could ever be enough, know enough, understand enough, live authentically enough to actually come close enough to that. So I'm going to cling to this uh, grace, which is our only saving hope. And in, the, and in a kind of backdraft like way, then create, I think, a sort of rationalization that falls prey to what in the two lectures that I gave so far is really, I think, uh, a, a kind of affinity, a, a, it's an abuse, but it's an affinity with a sort of proverbial vision of wisdom, which is tended to say, if you do this, that good things will happen to you. If you do bad things, bad things will happen to you. And out of that immaturity, which I think in many cases on most days under ordinary circumstances might be a wisdom that really guides us and orders us in a helpful way, which is what I think Proverbs itself actually means, gets morphed into a kind of reductionist vision of faith that suggests it's a sort of uh, platitudinous offering. And in that kind of a context, we attach ourselves to the right formulations of language, belief, doctrine, confession, etc., leaving behind, I would say, a life that actually lives authentically with the character of God being tangibly evidenced by my willingness to love, suffer, carry a cross, uh, Etc. Right, and I think that that the the way that the migration the the migration between Old and New Testament between between Proverbs, Job, and the fulfillment of what I think is the whirlwind in the incarnation, where actually the totality of human action in all of its desperate beauty and perversion is satisfied in the cross. That, all, that long trajectory is a trajectory of maturity, which Jesus, I think, in his ministry calls us as disciples to walk in. We are meant to walk in this way. Jesus is the one who is the imprimatur, the, the, the lone savior, but we are the ones who are called to actually walk in that way ourselves. And I think because of these other reasons, the church has said, let's just go back as the disciples were prone to do, as, as the scribes and Pharisees are prone to do. Let's go back to something that's more manageable. Thank you very much. A whirlwind uh, is a little too unmanageable and an incarnation is even more so. So let's just go back to some baselines of often reductionist uh, Christian platitudes, a tendency toward superficiality, a lack of reflection and anti-electionalism, uh, etc. All of that that I think is uh, is something that the church becomes very susceptible to and sadly covers on the grounds that we're people who simply are clinging to grace, not law. And in all that, there's just an amazing set of slights of hands that leave behind the vast evidence that I think the church is meant to be in the world of a, of a community that actually embodies the truth and character of God. Does that jive with your frame, Mike? I appreciate your uh, definition of wisdom and your call to pastors to um, not focus on the speech, the talking, but embodiment, the character. Are there pastors in your last few years of looking at preaching and studying preaching and going to seminaries and just being involved in these conversations, are there uh, people that you would point to and say, I really think they get it? They're, I realize that you know, they're, they're unlikely to be big names, perhaps, but you have seen people who are living in community and doing things in the churches, mm -hmm. moving and loving and caring, and you yeah. go, yes, I, I, would like, I would direct you to that mm -hmm. person. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you're right. Um, in my experience, they mostly are people that, whose names would not be recognizable to you and, um, and who don't... Um, who don't fan a following. Um, and what they do is point people to authentic discipleship in a way that is clearly being lived out for them in a genuine and costly way and frankly is going to be awkward for uh, the populist to, uh, uh, to want to be drawn to. It's more angular than that. It's more, um, it's more costly. So uh, yes, I'm very encouraged by that, and I'm 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 moved by that. I'm humbled by that. I'm I'm reminded by their witness of of the significance and the transformative power of that. I'm surprised uh, by the evidences of of a grace that is so quietly transformative, and the communities that are being shaped by their by their life and by their preaching. So yes, I mean I think that's really true. It, I'm sure there are well-known preachers for whom that is also true, but I do think that often 
um, the, the fog layer of uh, large prominent preaching pulpits is thick enough, not least in the literal age of fog machines as an accompaniment to Christian worship, that, um, that I think it is harder to discern. And um, there are layers of complexities about power and money and popularity uh, that I think make that very difficult. Any other? Yes. Mark, I, I was struck by your distinction between uh, a, a credible witness and a perfect witness. Yes. You said the culture doesn't expect the witness of the church to be perfect, but credible. I, I'd like for you to reflect on that maybe just a little bit more as it relates to pastors and church leaders. Because sure. it, it seems that a, a sort of uh, thought that we ought to be going for the perfect witness leads some to, on the one hand, just discount any possibility and they ignore it and to others there's this sort of pathological perfectionism right that that um, it, it ends up being counterproductive yes. but it's this sense that we feel like again we have to be perfect could you just reflect a little bit more on that right well I'm just thinking about <clears throat> there's lots of places where I hang out um, and just connect with people that are not in any way church people and um, and when conversations with people that are total strangers to me um, unfold. And if, if I decide that I'm going to tell them that I teach preaching, which is not something I leap to tell them um, in the hopes of actually having a sustained conversation as opposed to its immediate ending. Uh, if I take that risk, then there's always a response. So you realize immediately, of course, that everyone has an opinion about preaching. And then secondly, um, their opinion does get to this collision. And the things that they point to are not the things that are perfectionistic in their expectations. Um, it's really instead just sort of, you know, that, you know, there was this one guy, they might say, uh, who, you know, I, I am not a believer. I don't go to church. That's not my thing. But I remember this one person that I knew who was a Christian. And, you know, they, they were with us in whatever we were doing as well. But they did pay attention to people that no one else wanted to pay attention to. They did express a, co a compassion that some of the rest of us were really too self-interested to bother with, et cetera, right? They kind of go down that road. And th that would be the kind of casual data point that I would use as an, as an expression of that. On a, on a larger level, um, I was really taken by the death of John Paul II. And it happened, literally, this is such a funny, odd sort of story to tell, but it's, it was true and it was, it's endemic to the story, so I have to tell you this, but, but it happened on the day that his death was really um, going to be memorialized in the service on uh, St. Peter's Plaza. I was traveling literally from here to South Africa. So I was in, it happened because of the routing that I was in, I was in maybe five countries in the course of this one particular travel day. And of course, in each of the airports, in their own nationalities, there was coverage of John Paul's service. Now, the thing that was amazing to me about this was that I was in different countries, some of which had really strong anti-Catholic feeling and some of which had, you know, sort of atheistic feeling and others were passionately Christian uh, nations, I guess I would say. And over the course of that, I found it really amazing that people were so able to say, as, the, as commentators of all these different nations said, lots of things to criticize about John Paul II. He wasn't this, he didn't do that, I didn't agree with him on that point. This wasn't one of my favorite decisions, etc. And then people saying, but his life actually was a remarkable life. It bore witness to something that exceeds all those things. So even though I disagreed with him, I was disappointed by him, I didn't think he did this or that, what is so important about him is who he actually was as a person. Now that to me was a very interesting kind of anecdote, I guess, that I'm throwing into the mix to say, there was this evidence of saying, oh, I can make a distinction between perfection and that. This was not perfection. But was this credible? Yeah. Did, did, would I believe that if John Paul II said, Jesus loves the poor, that I could get a credible witness and that John Paul himself would be that? I think there's a lot of people who are looking for that sort of credible witness. Any other comments or questions anyone wants to raise? So this, this hunger, uh, really, for, for preaching wisdom in a uh, wisdom-hungry world is what I want us to now 
uh, reflect on in light of what I've just been saying about wisdom. When I say that the world is wisdom hungry, I mean it's wisdom hungry for the kind of wisdom that I'm talking about. But of course, I'm fully aware that the world that we are all a part of doesn't talk about wisdom in that way, and they don't name it in this way, but they reflect the longing for that in this way. So just, I would suggest a couple of thought exercises that I would encourage you as pastors, uh, those of you who are pastors, to, to perhaps take advantage of. I would encourage you to take a given week and to say, you're just going to keep a wisdom-hungry journal, <laughs> that you're going to be listening to conversations, newscasters, newspaper articles, television, movies that you might see, music that you're listening to, and just find yourself asking, so what are they actually hungering for? And what I would say I hear is a, a deep, profound hunger for something that makes life work that pervades economic discussions, it pervades political discussions, it pervades social, ethnic discussions, it pervades relationships between men and women, it pervades family concerns, it pervades uh, discussions of violence and war. It's, it's everywhere across the array. And if I was to say what popular non-churchy sounding definition might I use for wisdom, I would say biblical wisdom is what makes life work. It's actually what puts the pieces of life into a coherent vision, but it also heals, it restores, it reconciles, it has the capacity to overcome, it has the capacity to defeat, it has the capacity to save. It, it literally makes life work. Now, used in the wrong way, that phrase could be a phrase that could sound like American pragmatism, like the cog that you simply insert in the machine, turn the dial, and everything snaps in place. That's not what I mean. Because frankly, that isn't life. That's called a machine that we apply to human life. I'm talking about life, which involves much more subtle, ambiguous, complicated layering than all that. So wisdom, if wisdom, the truth and character of God lived in context, is the thing that makes life work, then everywhere I turn, it seems to me, I see evidences of people's longing for that. Now it's misattached. So in a day where attachment theory is a popular thing to talk about, I would say theologically, attachment theory is a lot uh, theological because we are attached and not attached to the right things. We're wrongly attached to things that will never satisfy and we're detached from things that could actually satisfy. So part of it then is how do I engage in conversations, relationships, demonstrations of love and justice and mercy in the world that actually invite people into authentic places where this wisdom that we're talking about is being sought, honored, named, proclaimed, affirmed, lived in some, again, very, very tangible way. And I'm inviting people into that. So this last weekend, my wife and I had an opportunity to spend our first empty nester getaway weekend with both sons now out of the house. We went to New York City, one of our favorite places, and we did all the great and wonderful things that a person can do in a weekend only really in New York City. So I think, for example, of the questions that were raised for me as we stood in, um, in Brooklyn. And we went to a variety of different neighborhoods in Brooklyn, some of which are extremely poor, some of which are, are uh, sort of, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the beyond cool 24-year-olds. The, oh my gosh, does anyone here even know how to write down the number 30? I mean, they're just like, it's an astonishingly young feeling uh, place, some of, some of the towns with, uh, in Brooklyn, and, or er, neighborhoods of Brooklyn. And in that context, we attended uh, a David Byrne concert, one of the uh, people who was, of course, very formative in the Talking Heads. So you go to this concert filled with people that are mostly in their 20s. David Byrne has been you know, actively a, a musical influence for probably 35 or 40 years. You stand for the three hours of the concert, the screaming, yelling, wild, amazing David Byrne concert. And most of the music that people got the most agitated about were the songs that were the oldest, of course. And they were the songs that, in a certain way, were the most despairing. So the declarations that he would make about the character of life. But all around me are people who are pursuing life. You vigorously feel that. What is it attached to? Well, it's largely attached, first of all, to themselves. It's attached to their own coolness. It's attached to their own sense of, of occupation, to their moment. To, but it's also attached at a more substantial level to their own questions. 
to their own sense of, of being restless and unsettled by anything that feels like easy reductionistic answers. It's, it's fed by the, by the desire for a life that is more than the life that they have, but not a life that completely gives up romanticism. So the interesting thing about David Byrne that reflects, for me, issues of, of, of a hunger for wisdom is that on the one hand, as you may know, some of his music is really kind of a techno music sound that's part of what is kind of his definition and some of his dancing gestures and the, and the beat of his songs is all that sort of techno sound. But wrapped around it is this extraordinary romanticism, a kind of idealistic vision of, of what it means to be human, to be in uh, a, a loving relationship, to, to, to name before the universe with the boldness uh, that, that only human beings can have, their declaration that there, that there is no meaning, that there is nothing beyond themselves, that they are just themselves, but they're doing it in this way that they are emotionally, passionately attached to, while declaring that actually what they're doing is itself meaningless. That disconnection for me is like the evidences of a hunger for wisdom. Now, it doesn't feel like you therefore walk across that easy bridge to go, excuse me, um, David Byrne, could I have the microphone? I'd like to share a word of wisdom with a wisdom-hungry audience on this night in Brooklyn. I'm not suggesting that that transference happens. But what I am saying is it shapes me. Having an experience of that and and standing inside the questions and the drama of that moment of culture expresses and inhabits things that I can and do connect with. There is a longing that's expressed and a perplexity expressed in those lyrics and in that energy, which I can identify with. While I also would say in Jesus Christ, there is a response, a, a rich, rich response to the very questions that you're actually giving. But I am with you in the passion of the questions and the, the refusal to accept easy answers and the longing for something that's more than the platitudes of the church and for the desire for the evidences of a life that actually looks credible, right? That's what I mean when I say we are, I think, living in a wisdom-seeking uh, culture. Now, tonight, there's going to be a debate. It will be listened to by millions and millions and millions of people. Some people would say, by definition, a presidential debate is itself an abandonment of any pursuit of wisdom. It has nothing to do with wisdom. It has only to do with uh, cynicism and manipulation and uh, the undecided in certain key swing states. That's hardly uh, a place to find wisdom, we might argue. It remains to be seen what actually is said tonight, uh, both what is said by each, but also what is said to the other. That will be almost the most critical part of the debate. It's not just what each says, but really the value of the debate is that they're now saying it to each other face to face in a way that has not been true up to this moment. That's why we have debates. That's why it's a different thing. Uh, it's unfortunate that we make such a big deal of these because they're so um, loaded. But in any case, so we come to an experience like that, a great moment for a wisdom journal to say, now what am I learning as I stand inside this debate? What do I think the people of the United States who are trying to make this vote decision are going to decide on, and by what criteria? What will be the values, the issues that are shaping what the listeners are going to bring to it? That's its own evidences of, of, of uh, a hunger for wisdom. And the responses of the candidates is going to suggest what they think is a satisfying response to those questions, or at least they're hoping will be a satisfying response to some of the people who are asking those questions. Now, in that interaction, I would suggest that part of the tragedy of our culture at the moment is that the bifurcation, the polarization of the two political parties has meant that really we, the church, sadly, has often suggested either right or left, that, the, that wisdom is found either right or left. I think that's an indefensible position given the character of the messiness of the kingdom of God and the way that Jesus himself both lived and, and had enough to offend everyone, left, right, middle, or otherwise. And so therefore, I want to listen to the questions that I think people are asking, but I also want to listen for what it is that the candidates are suggesting. And then I, if I was in a pulpit setting, I, don't tend to, I do tend to address political questions if, if I'm a, a, addressing a text that seems to me to be a, a legitimate text for that. But I would not weigh in on my view of who won or lost the debate or how anyone should vote. But what I would want to do is to, is to call people last Sunday to say it really matters in our citizenship that we think carefully and wisely about our leadership decisions. This is that moment. What are going to be the values that you're gonna bring through the debate? And then 
what are you going to listen for? And then by what criteria will you evaluate its, its capacity to actually demonstrate? And what is the connection? And this is a key issue too, in, uh, going back to Max's point about voice and touch. Do we believe that that leader or that leader will be the one that will more likely bring what we think is the break of, of voice and touch back together again? And for what reason do we think that will actually occur? Now, all of that to me is an example of simply attempting to try to be an active wisdom seeker. I'm trying to understand wisdom as it's practiced in the culture, but then I'm trying to bring to that the experience of what I think biblical faith actually enables us to consider. So an, an experience like that debate would be a great moment to then ask, what do we think? Now, the difficulty will be that we will probably evaluate tonight's debate by nature uh, of the case, the way that we tend to evaluate the significance of sermons. Did we like the sermon or not? Did it make sense? Did we like the stories? Was the punchline good? What about the buzz factor, uh, et cetera? All those sorts of things. Rather than actually the wisdom that may or may not have been actually given to us by the message. And likewise, with the debate, we will often listen for those things and fail to actually understand something that's deeper. And then even beyond that, we will be talking still primarily about words, not about action. So we're going to be talking about how did it get formulated verbally rather than how did it get performed. And part of the performance concerns, whether we're relating to either of the two candidates, are really why they, it matters from a biblical point of view is because we're actually looking for authenticity. We're looking for a credible witness for whether or not the person is actually living into what they are themselves affirming. Now, the very challenge of doing this, of course, in the political context is shaped by the fact that there are so many political factors that prevail that make it not in any way a story of a single person's actions, whether it's the president or, uh, or Romney. So either way, there's a complicated context that disturbs, arrests, sometimes diverts our actions. What do we make of that? That will also be a wisdom exercise. Now, the reason all this is the detail I'm going into is that in a way, I want us to think again about wisdom then as the question about the public discipleship of the people to whom we're preaching. Because what I'm trying to do is not just as a preacher form an, a capacity for theological affirmation. I'm actually trying through preaching and through many things that happen in the life of the church. I'm trying to actually form wise people who will be committed to a discernment and a pursuit of the truth and character of God and that truth and character being lived in their life and related to the particular context and setting in which they're meant to live and serve and work. So the greatest evidences of the success of preaching is by no means what happens at the door or in the visceral impact when you're in the sanctuary. It's whether or not it shows up in the public lives of people that are attending our services. And if in fact that trajectory is broken, which I would suggest it is, to that degree, our preaching then again is put in question. Are we actually preaching toward an outcome that shows up throughout the week in all kinds of offices and neighborhoods and backdoor fence uh, discussions and soccer games and in competitive settings and in non-competitive settings and at hospitals and in, in bread lines? Does it show up all the way in the context of transformed life in the world? That's what the question of the man with the orange tattoos was asking. If I hang out at your church, will I meet people that are like Jesus? Or are we just going to talk about Jesus here? Is this just a church that we talk about Jesus? Or is this a church where we talk about Jesus in order to actually be Jesus followers who live the truth and character of God in context? Surely his instincts were right that the, being a disciple of Jesus Christ should show up in tangible uh, evidence. Let me pause again uh, before I go on and just see once more if there's any questions or reactions. I want to illustrate this in a few more ways, but let me just pause. Hi there. Oh, this on. Uh, just a question on um, uh, just thinking about, uh, you know, interested with your um, you know, experience with John Stott Ministries and uh, just preaching in general. And uh, just wondering how this, uh, you know, in a typical uh, sort of... Um, class seminar on how to teach preaching to preachers, how some of this would 
how you would kind of encourage preachers incorporate this into the training program as to how to focus on formation in this sort of broader perspective rather than just the words. Right. I think the heart of it for me is really a focus on a call to simply immerse ourselves endlessly in the Gospels. Um, so I think the most formative thing is actually biblical uh, formation. And in, in particular, I think it really is spending as much time as possible simply immersed in the gospel texts themselves, certainly the, some of the New Testament. But I think there's nothing um, quite like actually just being in the gospels. And I think it is the cornerstone of our formation. Certainly it was the formation of the earliest preachers of the New Testament. But it was also, I think it is still, the formation that gives us an instinct that's different than uh, formulas, different than doctrine, different than um, styles of communication that have more to do with our sociology than have to do with the peculiar angularity of Jesus's confrontational style. So I think a lot of preachers by instinct and personality and or the pastoral ministry um, wanting to bring, bring, bring blessing to their congregation, wanting to bring um, good news, wanting to bring uh, peace to their congregation. But what that can sometimes translate into is I just need to keep everybody happy. And then my preaching becomes subject to the question of, are people happy? Um, do people like my preaching? It's really kind of unimaginable to think that Jesus would have ever asked that question. Do people like my preaching? I don't, I don't think that would be a question that would matter to him. But a great deal of our homiletical training is oriented toward, I need to help people like my preaching in some way. And then there's different criteria and standards by which that happens. I think by sticking in the gospel, you end up, I hope, living in that environment of, of, the, um, of the costliness, the angularity, the uncertainty, the surprise, the confrontation, um, the feeling that that's really the primary formation. And I do have to say that probably the preaching that, that has mattered the most to me has been preaching that in some way or another... Um, stays closely related to that instinct. It doesn't mean that I'm always only preaching on the Gospels, clearly. I'm just meaning that instinct is an instinct then that I bring to the whole exercise of, of interpretation and ultimately of sermonization in, in how I approach a given text and what it is that I would want to appeal to people to do. One of the ways in this is also then understanding that we put ourselves always as learners in that process. So, so the whole idea of the preacher standing behind a pulpit in a high-raised area speaking down to the people is, is a ar problematical architecture. I know that it's meant to honor the word, but it often becomes associated with the preacher, and then it's about literally my capacity to pontificate as opposed to um, what we're calling people to, which is this embodied, humble, um, sacrificial discipleship, which is the thing that I think is, is more the theme. So then the question becomes, what are the themes that are going to be um, seminal in shaping your life? And how will, that, how will it be that those themes are retained and nurtured in a church context, which will often fight those very instincts, especially, I think, frankly, when they are the most angularly Jesus-derived? Um, this is why in the formation of, of, um, of what I'm doing at Fuller, we're We've developed this program called MICA groups, which are regional preacher formation groups, which are um, groups of 12 preachers, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-denominational, multi-economic uh, groups that meet together for two years and, um, and respond together um, every other month. They meet for four hours and they work through a curriculum that's uh, some written material, audio and video material that we've either created or assembled for, for, to stimulate the kind of reflection, self-reflection, spiritual reflection, preaching reflection that will set people on a course as preachers of, I hope, being, becoming more empowered, wise preachers. That's the intention of what we're doing. And, um, and it's been, you know, it's just an early experiment. We have so much to learn about how to do this better. But I think that's all part of instigating this, this kind of applied approach that I'm discussing. Yeah. Any other? Uh, I really appreciated what you were saying about um, listening to the world around us, to the culture, to hear what those needs and hungers are for the wisdom of God, and, and especially appreciate your encouragement to all that, yes, indeed, the Jesus that we uh, serve and follow and proclaim does answer and respond to those needs.
But I was wondering if you could flesh out more what you said about how the, the church often has offered empty platitudes that don't really answer and bring, you know, God and, and Christ's, God in Christ's answer to those hungers and needs. Uh, what are some of those ways that the church has failed in that response to those, to hungers and needs in the world that, that uh, Jesus does have an answer, but we haven't served it? I think what happens, honestly, is just a lot of good intended diversion. Um, you know, the institutional church, which we, we are a part of, I am a part of, I, I live off of it. Um, people that go to churches, go to seminaries, and seminaries pay my salary. Um, and you are paid, if you're a pastor, by people who, for some reason or another, have decided that you and your ministry is worth giving to financially, and there are certain expectations of form, style, um, habitation, clothing, education, um, that will all accompany that. And some of it we could call neutral, but it's really not neutral, actually. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very elaborate, historically formed set of control mechanisms, which simply establishes its own sociology. So it's the, you know, I mean, you take a room like this. This just is not an accidental room, right? This, this room is a lovely room, but it's an imitation of many other such rooms where tens of thousands of dollars are spent on making sure the right chairs with the right kind of upholstery, with the right kind of angular back, with the right sort of lighting, with the right kind of sound system, with the right kind of, and on and on all of that goes, and we spend a lot of time then when there's a problem. So yesterday I was talking to a friend of mine who's a pastor of a church uh, in Hollywood, California, First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood. It has a very prominent tower. It turns out the tower has been declared to be unsafe for earthquake reasons. Now they have to raise a million dollars to do nothing but preserve the tower. So now that church will call its community to sacrificial giving uh, for the sake of preserving the tower. What is that, really? I mean, it's a real thing. I, I have been in a church with real things, real upholstery, real sound systems, real um, architecture. A million dollars for a tower while the world's going to hell. What, what is that exactly? Well, it's just the church doing what the church does. But how did we get here? Well, it didn't, we didn't get here neutrally. I mean, I find it both a joyful and painful exercise to go through the Vatican Museum because it's filled with the plundering of lives as well as exquisite artistic beauty, right? It's all there at one breathtaking moment. So, I, you know, we could go on about this, but I just feel like it's that, it's that convergence. So the question then becomes, not how do I abandon the institutional church and live in some sort of spiritual fiction that's disembodied and just, you know, uh, unseparated from real space and time, but but it does surely call us to, to ask questions about, but what do we really hold on to that's going to be of the essence of the gospel? And then are we sure that we're majoring in the majors or are we majoring in the minors? So I go to visit a friend of mine. He's a pastor in, in uh, the East Coast, very formal church. He makes a decision boldly, courageously, and very controversially that he's going to have uh, the, past, the, the ushers no longer wear morning suits, but actually wear dark blue suits. This causes a controversy of an extraordinary kind, which virtually put his call to ministry at risk in the minds of many people who wanted him to be thrown out on his ear because he had decimated the church. Now, we participate in leading churches that get fixated on such absurdity. So the question I think we have to constantly come back to is, where are we? Like, I'm not going to live in a pretend world. Where am I? Where am I and where are we the most hooked into the systems that are the least propagating to first order things, but absorbed with the issues of energy and passion and commitment that are perpetuating not only obsolescence, but actually something that's incongruent with the fundamental character and urgency of a, the kingdom gospel as Jesus proclaimed and lived it. So I think we all have to work out the answer to your question. Um, we're aware of the vast evidences that are there. The point isn't to get f frozen uh, and paralyzed by our failure, but to actually simply decide that there are things that we can actually do. We can actually decide as a church that we're going to try to become a church that really specializes in first things. We're going to try to figure out what we think those first things are, and then we're going to try to do those things. 
as faithfully and boldly as we can. And we're going to try to live a lot loose, looser with the other things that are not the first order things. Now, those are discussions that then have to come about theologically and, and otherwise. I shared this morning, I'll, I think maybe I'm supposed to be finished about now, am I not? Yes. Um, uh, there was this, uh, Gary Haugen, the founder of International Justice Mission, tells this really interesting story about um, a time when he and his older brothers and father were going to go on a hike up Mount Rainier. And uh, Gary says that he was the youngest uh, brother and very young at the time and sure that his older brothers and dad would leave him behind on the trail and that it would just be a completely miserable experience. So he figured his only way out was whining. So he whined and whined and whined until finally he got his dad to leave, them, leave him behind at the visitor center while uh, the older brothers and Gary headed off in their own, uh, their own direction and had a wonderful hike. He, being a precocious kid, decided to devour the visitor center so that he could sh show his brothers that he had really had the better experience. He memorized all the videos. He tried to memorize as many of the placards as he could so that he could show them that he really had the best experience. They came back. He immediately took them around and showed them the visitor center, uh, tried to impress them. They then started telling him about the real adventure on the mountain. And in the context of that, Gary says, it only gradually dawned on me that, in fact, the whole purpose of the visitor center was for the experience of life on the mountain. And then he says, it's my observation that there are many North American Christians that seem to me to be caught in the visitor center and that the church really propagates life inside it for and with the visitor center as opposed to life on the mountain. And there are many Christians for whom it never really occurs to them that the whole point of the Christian life is not about life in the visitor center. It actually is for the experience on the mountain. And the contrast between these two things is then, I think, worth exploring because of thinking of how many times uh, building towers on buildings creates long-term uh, costs which end up implicating a church of future generations in systems and decision-making which, which then bind them to an architecture which is thought, um, in this case, to be uh, importantly preserved and therefore occupies them in enlarging the visitor center. Let's get new videos for the visitor center. Let's get better seats for the visitor center. Let's have better placards for the visitor center, but you're still all inside talking to yourselves. And when you read the Gospels, I just think it's very difficult to make any sense of that in light of Jesus' ministry that is so much more public and angular and confrontational and demonstrative of the evidences of a good, loving, faithful, and wise God who seeks the shalom of the world. That's surely the thing that we are meant to be about, but it's not the place that we're actually living. So in that in-between space, some choose to simply abandon the church. I, I do understand those instincts. I'm not prepared to abandon the church, but I am prepared to say, if I'm going to stay in the institutional church, then I'm going to stay in the institutional church and seek to do everything possible to re-clarify my own sense of first order, our sense together of first order concerns, and how we make those first order concerns first order in our, in our actual practice, and not just um, a derivative that comes out when we sort of give a nod to the things that, that we think matter when, in fact, we're occupied with towers. So that's the tension that we live in. And I think there are signs of hope. I think it's one of the places that God can give us wisdom. And, uh, and I hope that that's, um, that's part of what can encourage us and challenge us as well. Thank you very much. Let's thank, let's thank Mark. Well, uh, please make your way to one of the mics. I, there's another one here. Uh, we can bring that over here. Um, if, if you would help us as people are thinking about their questions, um, uh, two things. How do you, I mean, inevitably what happens often is when we attempt to resolve or correct or remedy uh, an oversight, for example, the preaching for not just information, but transformation. There's, there's, there's an end goal. Uh, how do we prevent it from becoming faddish or from the pendulum so far the other way that there's no information whatsoever? Yes. yes so exactly. that's the first thing. And then the second thing, um, help us to understand um, how did you go about in your years of local church ministry establishing first things and doing so not just yourself but with a board of elders and others so if you'd help yeah. us with that please 
Yeah, very good questions. Um, well, the first part, I think, in terms of um, the pendulum swinging, for example, or faddishness, are, are two great temptations, overcorrection um, and, um, and, a, and a suggestion that, that uh, it's autocorrection. I sometimes think autocorrection is, is my regular experience on the phone that's one of the most irritating to me. And it, it is an autocorrect button that is the faddishness, the feeling that it's just all becoming... Some, it, it becomes an obsession in its own um, uh, way. So um, I think for me, the way out of that um, is by actually just naming it as publicly and as uh, overtly as possible. And to realize that if I'm actually going to do that, then I'm accountable. This is one of the things where I think the, the Reformed tradition, uh, the Protestant tradition really, is so helpful in realizing that there is a public accountability to the proclamation of God's word. And that part of the reason why literacy occurred wherever uh, the Reformation went was because of the need to for the congregation to hold the preacher accountable for whether or not what the preacher was saying was actually the proclamation of what was truly written. So if I'm actually going to do this, then I need to say, let's imagine that I, I, this is my first Sunday and I'm going to try to uh, begin uh, this new course of moving toward first order things. I would want to say, this is what we're trying to do. And we are, as a community, engaged in this. We've been at this I'm presuming several things I would say. I've been at this for a number of months with our elders and, and leaders. We've been having conversations about the significance of, of these themes. Um, we've come to a, a kind of consensus about what we've understood these things to be. But in actual fact, it's now, going, it's now time and it's going to be the, the case that we are now called as a community to attend to the word of God around these themes and to determine together as we, as we will whether or not these are really the things that we're going to hold on to. And then if they are the things that we're to hold on to, then the danger will be faddishness. The danger could be that we're going to swamp something that we think actually we should also hold on to. Uh, and, and, and we need to be cognizant of that and have as honest a conversation as a community as possible about those things, but not at the sake of that fear driving our willingness to actually take the risk of getting it wrong. So we might or might not have it all right. We're going to do what we hope is a credible job. We'll determine as we go on whether it actually is that or not. That's part of what our communal life is going to be about and part of how we then move into this call. But, but it is now, you know, the, the thing that we are going to be pursuing. And, and the test of whether we're faithful might be whether or not we're still having this conversation and still on track with these things in five years, not just whether we're on it in five months. Thanks so much, Dr. Laberton. A uh, question, you talked about uh, the, the Gospels and, and immersing ourselves in the Gospels being very formative. Uh, could you talk just a little bit about uh, uh, how the, the wisdom books in the Old Testament, Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes, are formative? Obviously, we, uh, we know we need to preach them as well, but, but mm -hmm. maybe even on a larger scale, how yeah. uh, those books shape uh, the way that we do ministry and lead our congregations. In right. Well, I think proverbial wisdom, uh, I, would, I would refer you to the two lectures that I gave before this because the, the first lecture was on Proverbs and, and Job, really, and the second one today was on the New Testament. So some of these connections, will I'm happy to uh, go over that again, but you'll get much more there than what I'm able to say right now. Um, certainly, I do think that those are part of the canon, and they are an extremely important part of what needs to be preached. So the question then becomes, how do we develop a, a biblical theology of, of wisdom and I think that pulls from, from many different parts of the Old Testament, not just from the portions that we typically call wisdom literature. But there's a, a number of places where, um, where in, actually even in the opening chapters of Genesis and in other places where you would find strong wisdom themes. And, and we would, I would want to build a strong sense that what I, my understanding of Proverbs is that Proverbs is really uh, a depiction of what happens in ordinary time in many places when, when life is more or less working. Um, and it pushes us in certain reliable, predictable ways to believe in a, in a, a, a systemic, um, deeply creation-implanted uh, element of how the world is itself ordered and which will uh, produce a fruit-bearing life. And uh, it, it should not be understood, I think, in its own context reductionistically, I said yesterday, or yes, yesterday, that um, that sometimes they become nothing more than bumper stickers. I think that's a that's not true of, of proverbs, but it's understandable that proverbs can become like bumper stickers, as though they're simply a, a, a simple declaration that's self-explanatory. When I think actually they're much richer than that, and they are call they are a call to a consistency of of action. What what they're not 
is um, overtly theological. They are framed by a theology, which I would call the theology of the covenant, but they are, they're not themselves nearly as theological as they are practical and horizontal in their implications, right? A lot of, of, of Proverbs has to do with horizontal dynamics of life as opposed to um, the overarching paradigm, which is that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But that frame isn't what Proverbs itself particularly explores. It's much more the implications of that frame in ordinary life. It's my reading of Job that Job and other parts of, of wisdom literature are a kind of point counterpoint to proverbial wisdom, which then takes proverbial wisdom and um, ignites it under the pressure of crisis, a crisis of, in that case, of innocent suffering. And the question of what happens to wisdom, especially retributive wisdom, uh, if you do good, good will happen to you. If you do bad, bad will happen to you. And then the reversal of that, which I think um, yesterday was pointed out very helpfully, was actually the way that Job's friends reversed that and said, if bad has happened to you, that must be because you did bad things, which Job then rejects and which causes the dialogue that goes on for so many chapters and ultimately the, the, the uh, exploration of wisdom that Job so deeply seeks that God himself would answer for why he is so uh, much a suffering innocent. So... Um, and, and the answer to that is God's presence in the whirlwind, which then becomes, I think, to me, it is the, a, a declaration of the wisdom of God that is not about the ideas or language of God, but about, the, uh, about God's own identity and presence with and for uh, Job that affirms uh, Job's doubt and questions and thrashings, even while recontextualizing it as a, as a mere mortal as opposed to uh, a div- God's own divine vision. Furthermore, then it becomes my understanding that that whole arc comes uh, to its fulfillment, of course, in Jesus, and especially in Matthew and in John, and then in um, various places in Paul's writing, um, these themes of the, the culmination of the, of the wisdom tradition are brought home in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So very briefly, that would be my understanding of how those things connect. Thank you, Dr. Laverton. Um, I was thinking of your, uh, this is now the third time I've heard you, and I've been thinking about um, this idea of wisdom as uh, as really formative for preaching. And I've been thinking about how in my own preaching ministry of maybe 10 plus years, how I've seemed to vacillate actually very much on the value of preaching. On the one hand, I see in the scriptures and in my lived world and experience how preaching seems to be an essential part of what God is doing in the world. And yet I am at other times quite discouraged, perhaps never more so than in my own pastoral ministry, at seeing the fixation of Christians on the 30 minutes of my talking once a week behind a pulpit. And it's brought me to a place where, if I may say, I have definite ambivalence about the value of preaching. And when I'm listening to you, I have a sense that perhaps this idea of of preaching as part of a greater wisdom performance might might be the solution, might allay my ambivalence about this. Uh, but I'm, I feel as though I'm a little bit on the cusp of that great discovery and was hoping maybe you, in having thought about it a little bit more, could help me understand if that is so and if so in what way. No, I think that you've captured something that's really absolutely magnificent. I think that is uh, how preaching needs to be contextualized. It's part of the large speech act of God in the world, of which... I'm a participant, you're a participant, the whole church is meant to be a participant, actually even uh, beyond the church, um, God is speaking. And, and yet peculiarly and distinctly, God is speaking through preaching, but it's, it's speaking through preaching that actually is meant to be consonant with a life lived among people as a pastor, as a disciple, as a, a brother or sister in Christ. And, and it's through the totality of that uh, embodied shared communion that actually then the standing and proclaiming the word actually begins to have uh, a greater authenticity and I would argue a greater power. Where the pastor is, is truly disconnected from their own message or disconnected from the church and their own message, which some preachers really are, is, is itself a great tragedy and probably one of those places where the preacher is, where the force of the preaching, especially measured by the standards of wisdom, is going to be less and less possible. So, for example, if I really believe that the whole thing that was going to form my congregation in, in wisdom was simply the proclamation of the word, as important as I think that that is, I would say I would be left in despair. I mean, if the only thing that, was that, that I could offer was preaching, that would be insufficient. 
but it's simply not. And it's simply not the case that it's the only way that people hear the word of God. Is it a distinct, unique, and I would say highly prioritized way that people come to get the big picture of what scripture is calling us to and an exhortation to the, to the uh, enactment of that kind of life? It is. I think it's peculiarly that. And, and therefore, um, something that I would suggest we, we dare not uh, abandon. But we need to keep it contextualized. And if we make it too much its own thing, like almost the diamond set in, a, in its own setting, and the whole ring exists for the sake of the diamond, that is not my understanding of preaching, and that's not my understanding of the, of the nature of the, of the Word of God. It's, it's much more salt and light. It's something that permeates everything, not something that exquisitely exists in its own atomized um, particularity. And that obsession with preaching, I actually think is an idolatry of preaching. That's a great danger, especially in churches that honor preaching. You can actually end up with a diamond setting vision of preaching that actually dishonors the authenticity of the word of God, which is a transformative word that lands in ordinary space and time and is not a specialized jewel. And when the gospel becomes a specialized jewel, which it is sometimes reduced to in that vision of preaching, I think we have undermined the nature of what the kingdom of God is actually wanting to do in the world. And we've made it an, an, an exquisite gift that is nothing like the ordinary, powerful, transformative salt and light that the character of the kingdom is really meant to be represented by. Does that make sense of what you're... Uh, Mark, I wonder if you... I, I'm, I'm completely with you with what you just said. I'm remembering an article that you wrote for a leadership journal... 15 years ago, and the opening line... You might be the only person in the world, Michael, who can do that. But well, yes, please, very, go ahead. it was very... And so now I could have it wrong, or you could uh, disavow it, but uh, it was just a very shocking line, and it was something like, uh, every Sunday morning, I, you know, step behind a pulpit and speak for God. And the only thing more ridiculous than that idea would be if I thought I was standing up there to speak for myself or something along yeah. those lines. Mm-hmm. So do, do I have that yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Because it's, right. it is a, I don't want to suggest it is a haunting uh, refrain, but it is a very sobering thought. And it has mm-hmm. shaped my thinking some. And so as you... I love the idea that preaching is salt. It's not. Uh, it's not the. It's not the diamond in the ring. That's that's brilliant. But what is the voice? You said preaching is a is a voice in the church. It is a privileged voice or a high priority voice. How do you how do you think about that? Well, I mean, one way of uh, you know these metaphors they always fail us um, as as all metaphors will eventually do. Um, but um, I I think it's. It, it is a, the word, first of all, the word proclaimed, the, the living word, the written word, the word proclaimed, are all avenues of, of God's um, self-communication. And, um, and so I would say preaching is a privileged form of speech that gives um, a person called and gifted to do that the opportunity to, to, do, to bear witness as as truthfully and as honestly and as um, as compellingly as they can to the implications of the message of a, of a particular piece of scripture, and in that context, then the 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 speech or the conveyance of the of the proclaimed word is a, like maybe like a salt dispensary, um, but it's also the fruit of other salt that's actually been poured into my life. Right, we sort of see it atomized. I'm standing here. Um, distinguished from your bodies because my body isn't yours, it turns out, and I'm standing here and not standing there, and I'm behind this pulpit and you're not. So there's, it's a discreetness that sort of belies the fact that my life is actually hidden in Christ, and I actually live in the, in the life of the triune God, whose life as uh, light and salt in, in the world is actually in me, but I'm actually part of this much larger context in which all of that is is also going on rather invisibly, the, the, the chorus of witnesses. And, and all of that is part of the moment when I then stand in a certain context and dare, by God's grace, to seek to proclaim um, the gospel, to preach. So I'm participating in what is invisible, 
but which is accompanying all that I'm doing. And I can only really do it because there are generations, multiple, multiple, multiple generations and places around the world and people known and unknown to me who have all affected the speech that I'm now going to get up and give and say, this is the word of God. Now that's all invisible. It looks like it's something that is my speech to my people, but in fact, it's participating in this much larger form of speech, which is God's self-revelation, um, and to which I hope the sermon that I'm going to give is going to be a faithful response. Does that respond to what you're asking? Mark, if I could expand on that just yeah. a little bit. Um, have, we, um, have we replaced the supremacy or the priority of preaching uh, almost to uh, mean the exclusive exclusivity of mm-hmm. preaching. That mm-hmm. is to say, um, let's give it the priority, the uh, pulpit ministry, and I think that comes from the, the, the Reformation mm-hmm. um, and, and beyond. But, but have we limited it such that the ministry of the Word is a whole lot more than that? It, it, so that's a culmination, but, but, but a ministry of the Word is my mo- Monday morning counseling session, yes, and it's my absolutely. Tuesday afternoon prayer right. session, and it's my Wednesday afternoon, et cetera. That's right. Would you confirm that? Absolutely. I think it's part of that, all of those forms of speech, which is why it would just be wrong for me to think that it's atomized in this yeah. little bejeweled way. It's much more this permeating sense that should permeate my life and therefore is part of all of my conversations and work. It's about what I do with the grocery store clerk yeah. as much as the counseling in my office. Yes. And, and it's, it pertains to the full range of life's dilemmas. Yeah. So um, when we go to um, conferences and we, uh, there's a subtle temptation, it seems to me, that we equate what we see there, what we see modeled there, as an exemplar of what ought to happen in our right. pastoral ministries in a local church. That right. is to say, our ministry is that of a pulpit ministry. Right, right. Uh, use that as a segue to talk about what you've tried to do with your, the, is it the MICA? MICA groups, yeah. Or yeah. maybe you have. Well, let me, uh, let me just say a bit about where I started with this, because it, it is interesting and makes the point I think that you're describing. Um, when I was a, a pastor in Berkeley, I get this call randomly one day from uh, Marguerite Schuster, who was on the preaching faculty of, of Fuller, saying that there was this position in preaching and this new chair and this new institute, and they wanted to talk to me about it. And I said, well, it's nice that you'd want to talk to me about it, but really, it's just so clear to me that I'm not the right person for this job, because I'm not a pulpiteer, I'm not a rhetorician, I'm thinking in my mind, I'm certainly not Lloyd John Ogilvie. Some of you may or may not know him, but he was the pastor of First Press Hollywood. He was the chaplain to the U.S. Senate. He has an unbelievable uh, bass voice and um, is absolutely the quintessential pulpiteer of a certain kind, right? So I said, I'm, I'm not a rhetorician. I'm not a pulpiteer. I'm not a homiletician. My, my PhD is in hermeneutics, not in homiletics. I'm not sure there is a discipline called homiletics, and I'm really not sure that you can teach anyone to preach. So clearly, this job would not really be for me, but thanks for calling. And she said, well, actually... Um, we sort of knew those things about you. That was one of the reasons why we were interested. I said that was awkward. And the conversation um, continued. Now, the interesting thing about this was that when I then did this work, as I mentioned about information, inspiration, and, and, and uh, entertainment, and then as I began to think more about these themes of wisdom, the great temptation was preaching is often seen as something which is encouraged through exemplars. Te- preach like they preach. Imitate or try on their voice in order to discover whether it's your voice. And That has always felt to me like such an incredibly flawed model. If the person was to say, be like that person who is such an authentic disciple that you would want to be like them, that would be one thing. Um, But preach like them, oh gosh, I I would never say to my child, you should really talk like your brother. Why should he talk like my brother? I mean, his brother, it doesn't make any sense. And yet that is the way that preaching is often seen. So... What we're trying to do instead, as I think I mentioned briefly, was that we have formed now these regional preacher formation groups called MICA groups. And these MICA groups are not about gaining someone else's voice or imitating someone else as the exemplar, but really finding the kind of encouragement in personal character transformation to also seek to find and affirm uh, and use your own distinct voice to proclaim in the embodiment of your life as an authentic disciple what it really means to lift up the nature of the kingdom of God for the sake of the world, etc. And therefore, on our website, the preachers that we feature are what I would call working preachers. They're just, they're just preachers that we want to lift up because they, we think they're good examples, um, but they're not, we're not lifting them up as exemplars. 
um, and we're not trying to foster a, a pulpitized, um, idolatrized sort of vision of preaching. It's much more um, a, about these other themes that we're talking about. And I think for the very reason that you're describing, that often we get fixated with the wrong thing, in that case, form, style, personality, a uh, certain kind of public giftedness, which uh, is too easily identified with, with preaching and therefore with that gift, when in fact uh, none of that seems to matter, as far as I can tell, very much to the kingdom of God. Other questions or comments anyone wants to raise? Just had a question wondering if, if you think two um, aspects, um, perhaps weaknesses of our culture, which are, are influence uh, in, in the church, uh, would be one like a, a platonic dualistic understanding and separation of mind and body and how that plays itself out and how we view knowledge and, and preaching. Yes. And then the second part, maybe related to it, and the second part, probably what you've already mentioned before here, is a, like this technical um, precision, knowledge specialization, fixation. Um, and if we just master the words, if we just master this, this technique, then everything else will just work out. Right. Um, just comment. Yes, both are, are huge traps. Um, the first, the mind-body problem, is, um, is, I think, extremely important. And it is at the backbone of what I mean about w preaching into a wisdom-hungry culture. Because I think the wisdom-hungry culture that I'm talking about is a wisdom-hungry culture that wants uh, voice and touch, body and spirit, to actually be one thing. Um, and, and the church lives awkwardly with that, right? I mean, we are Protestants. Uh, I'm assuming most of us in this room are Protestants. Protestants have done a particularly bad job of, of making peace with being embodied people. So part of a further answer to the question of why does our discipleship fall into the mind rather than fall into, the, fall into action is partly because we're prone to, to simply want to live there because it's a safer zone that we feel is more identified with the spirit than our body, which we're more suspicious of for all kinds of, of reasons, but which are, I would say, um, a, a collision that, that God intends because he's made us physical. The incarnation intensifies the meaning of our, physical, of our physicality. And I would say the physical resurrection is itself further suggestion that we are on a physical trajectory even in eternity. So there is a place for embodiment of some kind, I would argue, in, in, uh, in eternity, which is a piece of what further validates how important it is that we hold these two things together and not somehow let them fall into kind of an easy uh, separation that we really need to be people who, who actually live coherently with these two things together. So I think we encourage that in our preaching by, by naming those kinds of problems, by being, uh, by being able to lift up the text that we often have been simply inattentive to, where scripture actually speaks quite clearly about the, the tangibility, the physicality of God's intended good creation, which is itself being uh, redeemed, and which in some way we are ourselves both meant to exercise dominion and exercise uh, caretaking and even uh, to participate, I think, in its reclamation. So I think all those things are things that are a uh, thing that we need to push toward and, and try to encourage in the context of, of our ordinary preaching, but also in the context then of how we actually live in, in real space and time. So we don't try to propagate a faith that is just a spirit-only faith, but really a faith that, that lands um, in time, in bodies, in places, in homes, Etc. So the disconnection for me um, comes out on a on a larger scale when you come up with uh, this this um, study that the Pew uh, Foundation did when the country was so involved in discussions about the legitimate use of torture, a very bodied thing. You can't talk about tortures torture without talking about bodies, right? That bodies are being tortured for uh, the defense of self of national interest. When the Pew uh, group did its study, they found that white male evangelicals were the most likely to defend the legitimate use of torture in protection of American self-interest. Now, it would be hard to think of a group of people that probably has spent more time listening to preaching than that group of people, and who, if you gave them a test, said, does preaching matter, would be the group that would be among those that would say in the highest numbers, it really matters that we preach. But what is it? It's a disembodied I would argue, a disembodied spirituality that has made the legitimate use of torture an, uh, an indefensible uh, moral act from a biblical or non-biblical point of view, a legitimate thing as long as it protects me and my body for as long as I need it until I and me and mine get to go and be with God. I don't think that's an elaborate projection 
of where that little schematic goes. And yet it shows, again, this breakdown of body spirit that I think is just not coherent. We are body souls. We, we are, um, God intends us to be one whole being. And that kind of discipleship, frankly, is a lot harder. I mean, I think Dostoevsky was right that, that we can't stand the fact that we've been left with these dilemmas. So what does the church do? The church steps in and fills all the gaps to make sure people are okay with just being spirits. <laughs> or alternatively, the church steps in at other times and just makes sure people are okay about being, having bodies. But the complicated task of the work of the church is to call people to being body souls, right? To being whole people who are both physical and spiritual. So um, I think we have to work at it in every possible way. And it, it comes out in hospitality. It comes out in, in um, acts of sacrifice. The second question you asked, remind me again what it was. Fixation. Yes, right. Yeah, that's a very strange thing. I, I, I don't think that that fixation on the technique of preaching um, is probably anything more than maybe a couple hundred years old. At least I can't think of examples of that. When I think about commentators that write about preaching, um, n- no one exalts the reformers preaching as preaching in that, in that way. They might care a lot about the content of what they're saying, but it's not the, the art of the technical proclamation. That's much more of a technique approach that I think is about maybe it has affinity with kind of the growth of, of science and the, and the professionalization of knowledge and the feeling that, that the more and more expert were the only people that should really be allowed to handle something and to perform it in a certain way for the sake of the wider populace for whom such a goal would be an impossibility or something. I guess maybe that trajectory would, would be a possible one to suggest. Uh, so I think it, we need to, it's help, it helps, I think, to realize that it's, uh, it's a problem that's more recent. I think it's also endemic to a, a culture that is obsessed uh, with the breakdown in the iPhone 5's map program that would make you think that, that f- perhaps the world was coming to an end uh, because of map of uh, you know, Apple iPhone 5 not having a perfectly functioning map program. Um, that's an extreme example of our obsession with technique and it having to be exactly right. And then we bring to many dimensions of life an absurd uh, standard that is really never meant to be applied to something called being human. Um, and so I think one of the things that we need to do in our preaching is disentangle um, our, our faith from that kind of obsessive idolatry. Um, I used to say when I was the pastor at First Press that one of the great gifts of that congregation was that if you decided to do something in ministry that was Christ-centered and mission-driven and well-conceived, that it would, great, it would be greeted with, um, with very strong congregational support. It would be, and it would be in that order, Christ-centered, mission-driven. Because it's a church of people that are uh, over-educated, the well-conceived part, turns out it really matters. And the standards by which well-conceived is going to be measured has to do with sociology, education, personality, ethos, perfectionism, (coughs) capacities for obsessiveness, too much leisure time, um, et cetera, right? So so, I used to say, so Christ-centered, mission-driven, so far so good. Why are we quite so obsessed about well-conceived? As though well-conceived equals something of almost rival importance to Christ-centered, mission-driven. Sort of like, I fear that maybe we would say, if it's well-conceived, we'll do it. Now, fortunately, the instincts of that church were better than that, but I do think that that's a a dilemma, and the technique can entrap the preacher, but it can also entrap the congregation. Um, I tell in the opening of the Dangerous Act of Worship about going into this um, very, very large church that was having its first day of daily vacation Bible school. It happened to be a church that was so large that it absorbed a next-door neighbor uh, YMCA that was now inside the precincts of the church. You walked into the church, you walked up the steps through its gym, into its uh, athletic club, into its indoor track, which surround the gymnasium, where the thousand children in their perfectly appointed matching orange t-shirts were all uh, doing a dance led by a band that had been flown in from another part of the country and a a 20-foot soundboard and a light show that was all accompanying the daily vacation Bible school in that church at that moment. It was undoubtedly the best technique offered in that town for that Bible school that would, could be imaginable. But my fear, my extraordinary fear, is that that actually so um, uh, 
undoes the possibility of hearing the still small voice of God that I wonder in the residue of the kingdom, whether that or programs like that actually produce disciples or whether they really produce people who are yet more addicted to amazing technique and not really to an encounter with God. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Let's thank him again.